the memoir talks about my grandfather and it, it tells the story of my mother losing her memory and then me losing my memory and it's all about you know the the lineage of this knowledge and you know what what are things that we forget or what are things that get lost um, as as it's being passed on. Uh, so I'm gonna read from the from the accident part. So this is my accident part. My ears replayed the crack which my own head made as it hit the pavement. I imagined my brain coiled and white, pitching forward in fluid. I brought my hands to my head and pressed, as if I could stop the brain from hitting the cranium. When I broke my eyes open, there was a man in glasses pulling me to my feet. I saw a bike, mangled on the ground, and his car door open, mangled as well. I understood this is how I had ended up on the ground. The man asked if I was okay. He touched, then kept his hand at the small of my waist. I brushed his hand away. I am fine, I am going to ride away now. I picked up the bike, straddled the seat, and pushed my feet on the pedals, but the wheels did not move. The man smirked. His brows pushed lines into his high forehead. He pinned the front wheel between his knees and yanked the crooked handlebar back into place. He returned it to my hands. If I did not know about the mechanics of movement or wheels, I did know about the hulking smile of a man. I rode away, not looking forward, not looking back, not heeding his call to hold on a minute, to sit down, to wait. At the intersection, I got off my bike and stared, mesmerized, at the street signs. Madison, Halstead. Because not only did I not recognize the names, it suddenly dawned on me. I had no idea where I came from or where I was going, what city I was in, what my name was, and I did not even know the year. Somewhere, somehow, this struck me as funny. Nay, hilarious. Was I laughing out loud? I have reached to stop someone to ask them the year, and if they didn't freak out, maybe the city. But I pulled back in a giggle, knowing this is life imitating, life imitating. And it was at this moment when the man who flung his door at me passed me, whistling in his coat and hat, walking a small white poodle. Then a sentence popped into my head, the way words sometimes do of their own volition just pop into your mind. All good science fiction begins this way. It's a story where it was on the tip of my tongue, but I couldn't focus because I was raging with electricity. I was air packed together in sheer consciousness. I closed my eyes. I gave in to the current. I exulted in the corner. There was the noise of traffic, the bustling of people. I was euphoria, standing in place. When I opened my eyes, how much time had passed. All appeared to be the same, people waiting, then crossing at the red light. Cars going, cars idling, I am so, I feel so. There was nothing to do but wait for this wave of devotion to pass. Devotion to what? I closed my eyes. I am so, I feel so. How long did you lose your memory for? People ask when I tell this story, but the answer is never straightforward. Without identity, time is slow and viscous. A beautiful, barren place I never want to be taken away from. It's like the bottom of the ocean when the ocean has left. I like the scarcity of the black rocks, the clean feeling, the eeriness. I have so many questions I wanted to ask of the still wet ocean floor. When I opened my eyes, how much time had passed. I was still standing at the corner of Madison and Halstead. The crowd, the cars, the red light. Everything was bright and pure and unmitigated. I felt so powerful. I tried to stand still because it was the only way I knew I would not explode or drift off into space like a combustive celestial body. Everything is possible, every conceivable future when you are without a past. I only knew the things my body told me, that there had been a before, a place where I had borne some unidentifiable weight on my shoulders and against my chest, and that there was a now, a dizzying, unbounded place where I had laid my burdens down. You are now a blank slate, I told myself, then tried to remember what a blank slate was. A knowledge settled on me like mist, 
It was a state of being born into the world new and untouched by experience and time. There was a back strap digging into my shoulder. I considered it. The back was white and worn with little printed stars. I knew it contained clues to my old life, so I took it off and walked to the trash can. After throwing it away, I planned, I would find the ocean. I would scan my way onto a boat, and in the middle of the water, when no questions would be asked, I would continue living as a blank slate. I raised the bag over the trash can, but then I made eye contact with a woman through a glass storefront. And at lightning peak speed, I understood that the glance I had just given her, non-committal, arrogant, I had given to myself. I was looking at myself in the reflection of the darkened window. My hair was black and in disarray. I was a woman. I watched with astonishment as my own eyes, harried, unbelieving, had flown open, communicated back to me every ancient ebb of how I was feeling. People walked around me, staring beyond me like I wasn't even there, like a miracle was not just unfolding before all of our eyes, because it felt miraculous, the seeing of myself for the first time. I inched to the window. Up close, I examined my face, the thick eyebrows, the brown skin, the white nose. What heritage was written on that face? South American, Middle Eastern, Caribbean? I had no idea. I ran my finger on my brow, caressed my own cheek, played with my hair. God, my eyebrows are so thick. <laughs> How did I not know my gender all this time? I started to panic. It was proving difficult to remain a blank slate. I needed to never look at a mirror again. But it was addicting, seeing myself. I glanced, then looked, then gazed into my own iris. It was brown with dashes of caramel gold. What a strange fortress it was. I was patient and serene, thinking what key, what code, may help break the lock. Then, like turning a corner, I was terrified, choking, air was mud traveling down my throat. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw people crossing the streets and all intersections to avoid me. That was me screaming. That was me falling to my knees, gasping for breath. Hours later, a woman on the phone who identified herself as my sister informed me I should call my boyfriend and get to the hospital. I lied at the emergency room. The doctor shone a light into my eyes, took an x-ray of my brain. He avoided the word amnesia, but everything he asked seemed to dance around the word. Are you having trouble remembering anything? Is anything strange? I tangoed in response, no, everything is normal. The doctor narrowed his eyes. He stared at me quietly. I needed him to sign my release. I smiled, glanced at his pen poised over my paperwork, then stared directly into his eyes. I lied at what was supposedly my apartment. Because I had no sense of time in the wake of the accident, I kept time to the metronome of others. I danced to the punctuations of what I thought was expected of me. I didn't care how far I had to go, so long I could continue being a blank slate. I loved this strange vibration, and I didn't want anyone to fix it. I was at every moment soaring. I didn't care that I was lost to my past since I was absolutely found to myself. When the man who was supposed to be my boyfriend stripped that first night and lay down naked in bed, I understood I had to do the same. I dropped my clothes. I got in bed. He pressed his chest up to my back. He draped his arm over my stomach. Then his body relaxed. You don't want sex? I asked. No, I want to hold you. The boyfriend had to wake me up every hour to make sure my brain was not swelling. He was supposed to ask me simple questions like, what is one plus one? That was the doctor's example in the emergency room as he checked a box on a form. At night, in bed, I felt like a game show contestant. I had to study my answers, but it was hard to stay afloat. One plus one is two. His name is Jeremiah. My name is Ingrid. The city is Chicago. The year is 2007. No, 2008. No, 2007. <laughs> I fell asleep so easily, I didn't even notice I had fallen asleep. My shoulders shook. I heard Jeremiah's voice. What is your name? It was dark in my apartment, or were we in my apartment? 
If I answered correctly, I could go back to sleep again. Ingrid, I said. Something was wrong, but I couldn't remember what. Sleep was white fuzz. It wanted me so badly. I had to stay awake. I fought the marshmallow of nothingness, but soon I was consumed in it. Jeremiah shook me again. Where are you from? Nobody told me this question would be on the test. Leave me alone, I huffed. I'm sleepy. Just tell me where you're from, he insisted. Suddenly, I remembered what was troubling me. It was the million dollar question. Who was I sleeping next to? I felt unsafe. I'm from Colombia, I answered. I reminded myself I was pretending I hadn't lost my memory. I was doing whatever it took. I had to play my role as Jeremiah's girlfriend well. I snuggled my back to Jeremiah, his body strange and unfamiliar. I closed my eyes. I was at the bare sea floor again, rich with debris. I knelt by stones and writhing fish. I put my ear to the crack in the ocean floor. I felt the burning heat of lava on my ear. I wanted to hear what the sound was here at the beginning. It felt like only a second passed until Jeremiah shook me again. Tell me what my name is.